So, hi, Kevin. Uh, what was your first computer and what was your very first Hello World? Oh, boy. First computer, it was probably the Commodore 64. Um, we, didn't, we didn't actually buy it for computing. We bought it for a game console type thing at, at home. But then that's when I found out that you could do more with it. And, um, you know, I think, boy, you're throwing me for a loop here, but I think if I remember right, we just had like an old cassette tape is what was actually used to store things on uh, from that Commodore 64. Yes, uh, their name was Dataset, I think. Do you, do you remember which games did, did you play back then? Oh, um, what was it like? Well, the, the Pong game, I know that we had that. Okay. Um. But I think this was be then you had probably something before the Commodore 64 because 64 was more capable. The Pong was like, you know, the uh, I don't even know how the console was called. It was like without data set, nothing. It was just, just you know, fleshed games or like four games on it and nothing else. So I had, in one point of time, I had an Atari console with uh, similar capabilities. So they were like built in games and I could play Pong with it. How how, okay. old, how old were you with DC64? You remember that? <laughs> um, no, not not exactly. It would have been high school. Okay, so high school means yeah, it, thir 13? Um, no, maybe around 16, 17. Okay. Okay, cool. Yep. And uh, then how you started, you know, to code something. So you played games and you you got bored with games. So how it happened that, you know, opened... Or didn't open, you just you know didn't load the game and start coding in basic. Yeah, then there was a. Um, I, I guess I remember reading something that talked about how you could actually break in and modify some of the code, and so it was you know a lot of follow the instructions, cut and paste, not really knowing what I was doing, but it was interesting to see that I could start to control this machine by modifying some codes. But I really didn't know what they were doing at the time, but it still allowed me to interact with this machine. Okay, and I guess it was like endless uh, lives for, for the games, right? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is what I also did. But for me, it was simpler. I only had to know picks, picks, I think, and pokes. And with that, it was enough, you know, to have uh, endless lives. And then okay. you started coding, or what is the story? I mean, um, yeah, then um, there was a course at our high school mm -hmm. that was just a, um, it was kind of like a timeshare system. So it was like a teletype type mm -hmm. system that, you know, you would type in and it would end up fitting out, you know, the uh, tape that had the punch codes on it. Okay. And that was the first type and it was basic is what we were writing in mm -hmm. um and that that was my first experience with programming it was still c64 i uh, no, Th this would have been at the school um so it was some type you know it was like a um a teletype like machine i don't remember the make okay. of it or anything okay. um but then it would you know it, it was interacting with another machine and another room basically you know it was a uh, um shared machinery okay <laughs> interesting and where was it so yeah. which which city was it you remember that was it I don't in, know. Mm -hmm. yep um in austin minnesota so that's where i grew up that was a it's about well i work in rochester minnesota and so it's about 45 minutes away from here oh, okay. so that's where after going to high school and college and traveling around and working in other states, I ended up coming to IBM, and it ended up only being about 45 minutes away from my hometown. Oh, wow. So you travel a lot, you know, and then and then you end up, have, you know, 45 minutes away from, from the machinery yep. you started with, with Teletype. So, and now very yep. br briefly, yep. so you started with a Teletype. What was the next step? So you, you what, what you wrote then? So I'm just interested, you know, what is your road to Java from Teletype to over all the languages now to IBM and Java? Oh, mm -hmm. wow. I didn't know this was going to be such a quiz. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, definitely stayed in basic 
for a while. I mean, in in high school, this was just called applied math. We didn't even have computer science per se. It was just called applied math. And I knew that it was fun. Um, I had no idea that you could, you know, make a living at it. But then I ended up going to um, a college. It was called the University of of Wisconsin at Mm -hmm. La Crosse, and they had a computer science degree. Um, Most of that was in Pascal. That's what we ended up coding in in college was Pascal. Um, After that, I went to a company called, well, it used to be Sperry, and then when they merged with Burroughs, they became Unisys. And so at Unisys, there was a proprietary language that we used internally. Um, it was kind of like Pascal, but it, it was still it was a proprietary language. That, what is the name of the know, language? Up, I do not remember. Oh, but I remember Unisys. It is a well-known uh, company, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and you know, and mainly business computers. So I know our customers mainly wrote like in Fortran and COBOL. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we wrote in, and it was some derivative of Pascal, but I'm, I'm not sure. Then, after being there for about five and a half years, but that's when what I came you, to what IBM. You wrote, what you wrote is like you wrote, you know, access to database or what you did, to, what the program did back then. Well, okay, the one item, the, the one project that I remember the best, mm-hmm. um, and, and it was very fulfilling, um, and had to do with writing a... Um, simulation for chip design. Wow. And so Unisys was real big with writing, you know, or creating chips for, you know, various computer companies. And there was um, a requirement to have this software to help them with designing these chips so that, you know, the the connections, the speeds between all of the different connections, you know, they, they met the requirements for the, the electrical aspects of it, um, and then being able to run the simulation on top of it. Um, and that that actually turned out to be a project that I got put on because the previous project that I was working on ended up getting cut, and it was turning out that the whole the whole group of us we're actually going to be laid off because the, the whole area got cut. But then they found this one project that they said, okay, we've got this one project. It's actually based uh, – I was living in Clear Lake, Iowa, mm-hmm. and this was based in Alabama. And they said that um, we, we've got this one position where you could help out with this you know, chip design type thing. And so I volunteered for that, and so I was able to stay with Unisys. And that turned out to be one of the best projects I worked on um, while I was there. Yeah, that's cool. And um, how how far yeah. is it bet- between Iowa and Alabama? Um, the oh, distance, quite a ways. Yeah, um, Alabama is on the southern end edge of the United States, and Iowa is just right below Minnesota. So Iowa is up towards the north. Yeah, and Minnesota is in the north. It means it's also cold right now, right? Yes, it's getting colder every day. <laughs> okay, so the same here. So how cold is right now? So how many degrees? Uh, we, yeah, we have a high of about thirty degrees Fahrenheit today. Okay, so and we have below, six, you know, below zero. And we have six degrees Celsius above zero. So okay, we'll translate that so you'll know. Yep. So a little bit warmer. Okay. Cool. Um. This is actually interesting. So always, uh, you know, sometimes something like this happens that uh, you you get assigned to a project and then it's turning to be a really great stuff. And yeah, and how uh, the, was the project successful? Uh, yes, it was, and um, kind of interesting. I, I even got an award for it for being the at the time they called it the best software engineered project for this team. You know, so it it it, it was kind of special. Yeah, very good. And and you got a trophy or what? What you got? No, a pat on the back. <laughs> oh, okay. So, <laughs> okay. And um, and then because it was so successful, you left Unisys. Or what's the story behind? This was in Iowa. 
And um, the company down in Iowa, the writing was on the wall that it wasn't going to last too much longer, that it was going to be merged with the main office up in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And so I started to check around, and I had a couple of friends that were over here at IBM, and so I contacted them, and they aligned some interviews for me, and I ended up coming over to IBM. Cool. And and you st with which programming language you started at IBM or what you did at IBM at all? With IBM, I started working with the AS400. Oh. So that, today, it's called the I-Series, but before that, it was called the AS400. Yes. This and a that's what I started working on. I uh, did some Java projects, and uh, they run on AS400 on uh, Tomcat and le later on Tommy. And I worked with the engineers, which uh, worked, uh, which run the AS400, and I think they used RPG, the programming language, and they okay. were they were huge fans of the whole system. So they, you know, they showed me the terminal and they explained, you know, how the database is integrated with the transaction system and in memory. And this was actually, um, a, a, the, for me, it was really uh, interesting to to see, you know how engineers are excited about the whole hardware. So st but this was like five years ago. This is not like, you know, a long time ago, and they were still very excited. And this was one of the oh. largest installation of AS400 in, I think, even in the world or Europe, because the next one would be the Z series, and this was the largest AS400. The customers of the AS400, they absolutely love it. Yeah. They, they, they love where everything is contained, um, and um, they're very big fans of the AS400. Um, yeah, and we, now we they know. Have... Short story, just um, so one time they got an upgrade, and I was I'm really you know interested in upgrades of hardware. And they say some guy from IBM will came over and do a CPU upgrade. So can I just watch it? Uh, sure, why not? But you know, there's nothing to see. So again, I'm really interested in it. And the IBM guy said, you know, done. It's like, how is yep. done? I, I mean. You you didn't upgrade anything, right? It's like yeah, but uh, I was like, where is the CPU? I I thought you know he will just you know uh, go to the server room and you know replace something, and it turned out that the machine comes you know fully loaded. And what just go did is just you know increase the amount of CPU. It's basically it just you know applied the license. <laughs> and I was completely yeah. disappointed. It's like oh man, I, I really thought I would see the machine. And at one point of time, I was able to see that. And it was not that large, you know. It was like a small machine, actually. Yes. Yep. Cool. Yep, very much so. And what you did with the S400? So you program RPG, or what you did with the system? No. So I worked on workstation support. Uh -huh. So both the workstation display and more towards the printer emulation. Okay. So, um, you know, this allowed your PCs running Windows Mm -hmm. to be able to connect up to an AS400 and then be able to do, you know, your your normal operations on the AS400 and if you needed to do any printing, then you could uh, print it on your local PC hardware. Okay. Okay. Um what I forgot and to so, ask you because uh, because of your background, uh it was like, you know, your professional career so far, but uh in your leisure, you were also into computers, so you really like programming in the leisure or you just, you know, it was like, you know, a 7 to 5 job or 8 to 5 or 9 to 5 job. That would kind of depend on what time of my life you are asking about. <laughs> yeah. um, earlier on, it was more of a hobby. And I would say like, um, you know, before we started to have um, children. Yeah. And like I, I was one of the first ones to have an Amiga computer. Ah, Do you remember those? 500. Yep. Yeah, a great yep. machine. And so I, I would get one of those to you know to learn about that aspect of the programming and, and specifically the user interface type stuff that you could do with it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the graphics. And so I I that was more of the hobby aspect of it. After starting to have um, kids and getting more involved with their activities. Then it's more of you know I stay involved because I well you have to stay involved in this uh, industry but you know I I've got computers at home but it's more for just you know keeping track of um, you know um, uh, personal type stuff you okay. know 
Okay. And use it as a tool, but I, I don't I don't use it as a hobby at okay. home. So uh, now you got the printer emulation stuff, and um, yep. What happened then? So you stick with? Were you satisfied with the job with the printer support, or what happened next? Nope. Then I I was getting a little antsy. Um, where I don't know somewhere around the five to seven years with IBM, and it was kind of like okay, I, I need to do something different. And I actually started to look outside of IBM, um, and actually that turned out to be good because then when I started to talk with people, you know, my management within IBM and saying that I was looking outside of IBM, all of a sudden more opportunities opened up. And so one of the things that I ended up doing is moving into an area that um, it was actually SOM and DSOM. You remember those technologies? Yeah, they have something to do with uh, file system and transactions, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you either, you know, the D stood for distributed, um, distributed what, system object model, I think is what it stood for. Um, so a lot of things related to, um, you know, well, persistence came into play, yeah, but, um, transactions. But what was it? I forgot. I only know the term, but I forgot what it actually was. Was it a product, spec, or what was it? Yeah, it was a spec. Okay. Um, I don't remember who I, I don't remember the group. Okay, no, I will look it up. But developed it. You remember that? So I, I, yep. I did something with the DSM. I only knew that something was was transactions on the databases or persistence. So that's what I remember. Uh -huh. Yep, yep. So and then that work kind of evolved into um, a product that we developed at IBM called Component Broker, and this was a C plus plus application server. Okay. Okay, so kind of a precursor to what we have with the Java application servers, but it was written in C++. Okay. And <laughs> we, we had that, I don't know, it was for a couple of years. I, I, I can't remember how long we had worked on it. And then um, IBM made a, a little purchase at the time of uh, TransArc. And they had this uh, application server that was written in Java. And so we started looking at that, and that became the new application server that we decided to, to go for, and that's what was eventually named WebSphere. And so I've actually been working on aspects of a WebSphere ever since it was born. And that's that was interesting. about 21 years. So what's, uh, what's, uh, what, what I would like to ask you is because I've, as I started with the application servers, I started with the Java web server from Sun. And uh, okay, I and I think so. I I just bought the uh, immediately. So it was you know available. So I uh, I I waited for that because I had to write a content management system, and uh, clients ask me, and uh, they asked me to do it in PHP. I had no idea about PHP, so I said, okay, the only thing I know is Java. So I waited for the server, bought the bought the server, and I started hacking. And so I think it was in February at the first version, and in Germany. There is a conference called Sabit. It was a huge conference, and what I remember, oh yes, yeah. And what I remember is, it was like I think it was the, the same year, so like half a year later, I visit the uh, the booth at IBM and I saw the WebSphere one, and what I saw is that the admin console from WebSphere was almost identical or was identical to the Java web server console, and and my impression was. That was either joint venture or Sun and IBM had the same, you know, uh, application server behind the scenes. So did Sun also bought, had something with the Transarc, or was it a, a co coincident, or what, what? What? What was it? You know it? Yeah, that. Well, okay, so it must have been a coincidence because there there was no joint venture between IBM and Sun okay. on that. Um, so. I don't know if they if they looked you know if the admin console looked to be the same I that that's the first time I've heard of it I I did not realize okay that. because I always wanted to know to ask someone on WebSyn and no one could un answer you know, the questions or what it was it, was it possible that IBM sold support for Java Web Server in a brief amount of time this could be the answer you know that there was a Java Web Server sold by IBM before what started I am not aware of that. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm not aware of that. It very well could be, but I don't. I'm not aware of it. And definitely the, not branded as WebSphere. 
This could be the explanation. No, I, I just uh, the IBM booth. I saw you know the Java web server basically with IBM logo on it. So this was what I saw. And this could be actually before IBM bought Transact. Probably there was no a short period of time where they had licensed Java web server. Whatever I saw, doesn't matter. But the Transact, I remember yeah. the Transact, the name as well. So I will do some research. So nice. So you started with the um, web server from the beginning, from web server one zero, right? Yeah, um, actually, I don't even know if it was labeled 1.0 with our first release. Um, it it might have been a we, – we might have jumped that based on the TransArt numbering. Um, okay. What I, what I worked on at the very beginning was more of a – what we used to call the bring-up lab. And so when we would get all of these different parts of – well, first of all, component broker in the upsphere, and we had development all around the world, you know, because we had people in Rochester, Minnesota, and Austin, Texas, and Raleigh, North Carolina, and Poughkeepsie, and the UK, and eventually China and India, and all these pieces had to come together, and so we had this thing called a bring-up lab that would pull all of these parts together, and our job was to actually get all of these pieces to work together and to come up as a functional server so that we could actually test it. So and then, CICD. you know, as we would experience problems, then we had to work with these different groups to try and get them resolved. Mm-hmm. Like continuous integration, right? Yeah, <laughs> a very basic view of continuous integration. Yeah, a 20-year-old um, okay. continuous integration. And this was your role, yep. you know, to, to keep it running. At at the very beginning, yep, that's what it was. Okay, and then you evolved from there. So what I, I, I think um, as the website started was this JDK one one eight or something like that, right? Do you remember that? So it was before one two, right? I am not exactly sure of the Java level that we started with. To be honest, not because, sure. Because what I remember exactly is that uh, with the Java web server stuff. Uh, we we started before 118 because with 118 there was a performance boost which I remember for projects so we waited for the 118 so um, 12 come later so this is of the timeline okay but um, okay and then what was your next endeavor at IBM so with web so you stick with the group or you moved to something else or what's what what happened major development effort I guess after the breakup lab was um, JCA the uh, um, J2E Java. connector architecture, mm-hmm. Java connector architecture, and getting uh-huh. that, yep, getting that integrated with our WebSphere application server, and so we wanted to rewrite our whole connection management mm-hmm. based on JCA. So our database connection manager, we wanted to rewrite using JCA, and so that's what we ended up doing is you know pulling in the JCA spec. And getting that to work not only with our database connections, but then also our messaging. So it, it provided the basis for that whole uh, implementation and runtime. And this is actually very good because right now this is how you can, for instance, integrate uh, b- uh, between JMS and MQ Series and, for instance, Payara. So you can use the JMS JCA connector, right? Yep, exactly. And you, you know the year? When was it? 2003, mm. four, something like this. Uh, would have been would have been before that. Oh, really? I so, would say uh, I would say maybe 99. Wow. 2000 well, around there. But then it was. I can't. Yeah, it was really early. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it. I can't remember the exact dates because I do know that after that effort, then I ended up um, moving organizations. And I led the development of the hashing um, solution that we had. Um, it was called, well, it went through many different names, um, Data Grid, um, and then what did it become after that? Well, Object Grid, okay, and then Data Grid, and then I think it became Extreme Scale. And um, Billy Newport, I don't know if you recognize that name. Um, Billy was our lead. He was a distinguished 
engineer at IBM, and he was the lead for the caching um, effort. And he he was you know needing some assistance, was trying to make this a real portion of the WebSphere offering. And so it wasn't actually part of the application server, but it was an add-on to WebSphere. Yeah, what I and remember so was I, just like WebSphere Extreme Scale. There was like, you know, the branding back then. Excuse, yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the, yep. was the caching somehow special? So you used some nice things like, I don't know, consistent hashing or some, or was it just a, you know, stock caching solution? Um. <laughs> It um, well, when we started, it was pretty stock. Um, there there wasn't a lot to it, but we you know we continued to improve on it uh, to make it more of a distributed caching mechanism. Um, you know that's when the, the hot term was eventual consistency, and okay. I think it still is kind of a hot term. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that that's what we were driving for, um, and being able to define a programming model so that whether or not you were doing you know, a read-only cache, or, mm -hmm. you know, if you wanted to, to allow writing to the cache, then, you know, do you delay the writes, you know, to be able to allow it to sync up with other applications that are trying to write to the cache? So um, it it got a little bit more involved, um, but I didn't stick around for the um, – I, actually, I think I – I think I left right before it got rebranded to Extreme Scale. Okay. Um, because what what came up was another opportunity to come back into the WebSphere organization and lead the JPA work, the Java Persistence API. Exactly. And so I I kind of jumped at that, and so I participated on the expert group, and then ensured that we had the proper implementation for WebSphere. And that was actually my first interaction with open source mm -hmm. because what we did at that time is we used um, the open JPA project from Apache. Exactly. And so that was my first or my initiation into open source. And um, it, it's, it, it's been great. I, I have really enjoyed working with open source ever since. Yeah, what I remember seeing you in the, uh, in the mailing list from – the uh, JPA spec, and I think it was around 2005 we are talking about right now, right? So it was the earliest. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And right. and you were also yep. a committer of OpenGPA? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you wrote the spec yep. in OpenGPA? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, OpenGPA was, you know, the, the initial stuff came from um, BEA, actually. Um, what Cal? From BEA? Um, yeah. Yeah. BA got toppling in one point of time. This was WebGain, and they got toppling. And toppling was bought by Oracle. So this is interesting. I didn't knew that that uh, Open J properly Open JPA donated. Uh, sorry, uh, BA donated Open JPA to Apache, and then bought toppling. This could be something like this. But you are sure I, uh, this was BA? Um, I was pretty sure because the people from the Open JPA project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because most of them didn't. They they were with BEA when Oracle bought them, mm -hmm. and that culture didn't sit very well with them, and so they ended up leaving shortly afterwards. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. So okay. I, mm -hmm. I thought it was BEA. Boy, now now you've got me questioning my memory. So. That is, could be. I will I will look it up. It's an interesting story. But because I uh, didn't know, you know, the roots of OpenGPA, and I know, you know, what Eclipse Link, Top Link. And uh, WebGain, BA, and Oracle, but OpenGPA, I, I thought it was just started by, you know, Clean Room Apache project, but uh, do donation from BA, yeah, BA had some stuff. So it could be, yeah, okay. And um, and, yeah. and and you became immediately committer, or how this worked? So you just contributed some code, or wrote some patches, or how you became committer of OpenGPA? Um, yeah, so it was a new project to Apache, OpenGPA. So it hadn't even been contributed yet. So when it got contributed, then um, there were some people from IBM that kind of got, you know, grandfathered in. And so luckily I was just put in as a committer from the very beginning, even without having to do any code yet. Oh, cool. So this was a nice 
nice uh, integration. And by the way, um, how you learn Java? You learn Java with the TransArc and uh, WebSphere uh, first release, or, or, or you you learn Java on the job, or you knew Java before? Um, no, kind of learned it on the job. Um, I was, I'll, I will admit, I was probably better with C plus plus. Um, and then we had to learn Java when we moved to the WebSphere um, effort. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my work, I, it was probably with the JCA effort. Um, that that was probably my first experience. And it was just kind of like learning, you know, on the job by okay. the seat of my pants. And you like Java or do you prefer C++? So what's... Oh, no, I definitely... Uh, <laughs> Definitely like Java better. It just took a little bit to figure out, you know, some of the nuances there. But um, afterwards, no, I thoroughly enjoyed Java better hey, than cool. C++. Okay. So, okay, then um, you were open JPA committer and you wrote the JPA spec. And um, the question is, you know, why? So IBM wanted to, I don't know, to participate more in standards or, or move the standards to a, to a direction or what was the idea back then? So why you did it? Yeah, um, part of it, I mean, it, it was to get IBM more involved with open source. And, um, you know, there was the effort with um, the Geronimo application mm -hmm. server. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, but Geronimo was separate from WebSphere, um, even though later on it ended up where IBM actually bought, you know, the um, Geronimo or the, what was that team? Um, I, I only know that blank. So, so your counterpart of you was uh, probably David Blevins with OpenEGB, right? Yes, exactly. And I, so David and I, we worked together, um, you know, as IBMers many, many years ago, um, and on EJBs and JPA, and then he ended up, you know, leaving IBM in order to drive Tommy Tribe. Yes, but. Um, what interests me was like, you know, so you started with open source, but obviously it was a lot more like assignment. And I think the same happened to David. So it seems like in IBM, a manager decided, you know, now we do open source. And then the whole department did open source, right? It was like this, right? Yes, but there still is a lot of, you know, at that time, there was still a lot of, um, I'll say, angst about open source there there were still a lot of people within ibm that wanted to stay proprietary so there's definitely aspects you know the the older web sphere implementation we had quite a combination of proprietary software and then open source mm -hmm. and we we were doing both to figure you know basically to kind of fill the holes you know so if we had the technology and we had the people then, you know, we, we would use our proprietary implementation. And if it was something new, then we would look at open source to try and uh, work with the community and come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, kind of a combination. Okay. And, yeah. And um, so you did the, the open GPA and, and the spec, and you did it until the end, or what? You just mo moved on, or what was your? Because um, then it's where I first saw you know you uh, your your mails, and uh, I say you are really. My impression was you are the absolute expert in persistence. So I watched what you wrote, and there was no long emails with explanations. It's like a, a really you know competent and nice guy. So uh, what you did then? So uh, you, you just stick with the persistence? Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think of. When I, I guess, I'm trying to think of the exact year, but there was, um, you know, I continued to, to work on JPA through, I think JPA 2.0, I think mm -hmm. was the last spec that I kind of worked on. And then at that time, then there was an opening because there was an IBMer that um, was working, you know, kind of our architect for J2EE and Java EE, and he ended up leaving IBM. And there was an opening, and I was asked if I would be interested in taking over the whole um, architecture of Java J2EE, Java EE for the WebSphere product. And that's when I started, kind of basically in my um, current role. And now, of course, it's kind of expanded because of Jakarta and MicroProfile, but that's um, I, I'm trying to think of the exact year. I don't know. It would have been around, I don't know, 
early, maybe 2012, 13. Wow, that you are actually responsible for the whole website right now? Um, for the uh, programming models. So that's yeah. for um, Java EE programming model, MicroProfile, and now Jakarta EE. So you are the architect of programming models on WebSphere, right? Or is it more like... Yes. Yeah, okay, interesting. Yep. And uh, you had something to do with uh, WebSphere Liberty or Open Liberty as well, or you stick with the WebSphere Classic? Um, no, definitely. I mean, just about everybody is involved with Open Liberty now. Um, okay. uh, you know, to, to be honest, the, the development of Open Liberty is much more fun than the development of traditional web sphere. Oh, um, really? You know, it, it's more it's more <laughs> fun for our users, and it's more fun from our own development perspective. Just because that you know the quick ability to be able to write code, test your code. Um, and do it in such a quick manner with Open Liberty. It's ju it just makes that whole cycle so much more enjoyable. Um, yeah, this yeah. is the problem. I enjoyed the old uh, classic website a little bit more because you can start at the server, then you can brew a coffee. You know, you pick the coffee, come back, and you see something <laughs> happen on the screen. And now you do something, and you see immediately, you know, something on the screen. So, and you have to, you know, to keep working with uh, classic. It was more like a relaxed environment, I would say. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, that's 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 one way to look at it. Yeah. Um so um it is also my impression that like you know the uh no, no the new stuff happens on on open liberty and web liberty. Uh what I'm interested in open GPA is, is still IBM is working on it or is it like uh Yeah, IBM is still supporting it okay. uh, because we we have you know we have an implementation both in traditional web sphere and in open liberty. That supports OpenJPA, I think it was through JPA 2.0. And since that time, we have moved the implementation to Eclipse Link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because we have customers that are you know, still running on the older um, versions, then we still do support OpenJPA. So we still have developers that are committers and you know are actively working on OpenJPA, but it's from a... Um, support standpoint, not a new feature standpoint. So okay, so now you are uh, the uh, the uh, the architect for programming models. So, what's your opinion about the programming model? Or I mean, Java, Jakarta, and MicroProfile. So, what's your you know perception right now? So about the programming models, what do you like to do? What do you like to change? Okay, so um, I I also got involved with the MicroProfile right from day one. Mm -hmm. um, so I I was involved with that when uh, when we first came up with the idea, and I have really enjoyed working on MicroProfile and being able to um, come up with all these different components and features that make up that MicroProfile platform and how how quickly really it has caught on. Um, the the one thing that is still really amazing to me. Um, the Eclipse Foundation, they do a developer survey every year. And so two years ago, they did a survey of, you know, and they asked about MicroProfile. And it was like, it, I think the numbers were somewhere around like a 13%, you know, they, people were aware of it and maybe using it. And then last year, so just one year later, it was already up to like, 36 or 38 um, percent and so that huge increase you know basically a threefold increase in the um, understanding usage you know however you want to put it of that micro profile programming model um, that that has been um, you know a very very nice bonus I, it's just been very good to to work on this project now Yes, where, uh, I have a question. Uh, were you at the very initial call? So I, there was a one call. I was also in the car. I remember there was John Klingen and the uh, Red Hat guys. Were you also on the initial call? Were we talking about the micro profile idea? On the initial call. Yeah, there was a call between. I think it was John. There were there were David uh, people from Red Hat. I was. Uh, I, I remember because I was on my Air Hacks workshops in Munich, and I drove back in the car and and and. And uh, we had uh, several calls, but the very first call was like, look, we're thinking about having, you know, micro profile, which is not a profile. 
And I say, okay, why? Yeah. So I think you was all, you were also on the call, right? Yes, yes, I was. So, so what the, what the, happened before? So how it started? What interests me because I was in the call, so at least there was an idea that something like micro profile could be could be useful. But um, how yeah. the the whole you know thing started? Because there was Red Hat involved. You were involved. You met at conference Java One, and and who got the idea of micro profile? You remember that? Yeah, let's see. Who came up with the idea? I am not exactly sure. Um, we did. I. I know it started at, I think it was a DevOps UK. Okay. And I know two people that were definitely involved. There may have been more, but I know Ian Robinson from IBM and Mark Little from um, Red Hat. Yeah. They were talking about, okay, Java EE has really died down. And, you know, they don't know what's going to happen with Java EE 8. You know, Oracle's not moving on it, but... All of this new stuff is coming with microservices, and what are we going to do for the enterprise Java developer in order to support microservices? Mm -hmm. And so with those two guys talking at this conference, I think that started the conversation. I don't know that they came up with the name MicroProfile or not at that time, but that's what started that, um, that discussion. And that would have been DevOps UK in the spring of 2016. And so between that time and then Java 1 in September of 2016, that's when we gelled this idea of putting together a microprofile 1.0. Yeah. And, you know, and that's where we actually, we just took three, um, three specs from Java EE. So CDI and JAXRS and uh, JSONP and those we just decided that those were the only three Java EE specs that were basically required for every microservice. I mean, we went through a lot of other discussions about okay, what about servlets? You know, and it's like, well, you know, there'd be pros and cons, you know, to bring that in. But at the end of the day, we decided nope, it was just those three. That those were the only three that were required. So that's how we defined MicroProfile 1.0 when we announced that at Java 1 in 2016. Yeah. And and this, uh, at the beginning, I was like, okay, uh, is this um, nice marketing? But uh, for me, it was completely pointless but because I thought, you know, okay, all the servers I know uh, <laughs> were, you know, lightweight enough and they, they come with the stuff. So why you should choose something different? And uh, and I ignored MicroProfile for years and um and uh, all my clients are like don't I, I have no idea why they are doing this, it's just marketing, you know. And then what what was the initial, you know, what's what what happened was that suddenly all application servers supported Java eight and MicroProfile. And this was the best decision ever because now you know you can you can easily enhance the old applications with you know the microservice or cloud goodness with microprofile or you can decide just to use microprofile but it's a smooth migration you don't need you no know, esoteric runtimes to run microprofile right right yep yeah and that's you know and then once we started to add the additional capabilities onto microprofile beyond those three base java ee systems you know so then we had um the config and fault tolerance you know, and um, you know, I can't even remember the health, the ones that made up the exact first, you know, the the one point one release. But um, you know, th I think there were four or five different uh, capabilities of MicroProfile, and that's when it really started to show that okay, now we're providing something that is beyond just those three pieces of Java EE. Exactly. Yeah, and this is where I began to be interested because at the beginning, I think it was config and health. And I say, okay, this is a little bit interesting, but not, you know, uh, a big deal. And really interesting were the metrics, because, you know, to write a matrix by yourself and, and produce the strange Prometheus or open metrics format with the underscores, this is what I was not interested at all. Because, you know, re-implement the config property, uh, I'm sorry, config property, the conf, MP config with CDI is easy, health is trivial. But uh, uh, open API, you know, metrics and, and fault tolerance, this is where I would say you spend a significant amount of time, you know, writing uh, infrastructure, which is already provided by MicroProfile. Okay, so, uh, so now you're working 
I would say on the same level what you worked before on OpenJPA, just exclusively with MicroProfile in Jakarta. Yeah. So then, you know, this move where when Oracle, you know, kind of woke up and they saw the the benefits of, of MicroProfile in the open source environment, then they uh, presented the idea of um, open sourcing Java EE. And that's what eventually became Jakarta EE. And that's, you know... I, I think you know because you've been following this. That was kind of a painful process. It took almost two years um, from the day when Oracle was announcing it was going open source before we were finally able to release Jakarta EE8. Um, so it, it took quite a while to get to that point. But you know now, now the challenge is to show that okay, we're going to do something different with Jakarta EE. So we don't we don't want to fall back to the old three or four years between each release. We want to show that we can have a, a regular cadence. Now, maybe that's not going to happen right out of the chute, but we do have to show that we can do something on a more regular basis. And, you know, and then if we do a release every, you know, every year, or if we follow the Java SE model and try to do it every six months, I mean, that that's something that we still have to decide on but we first have to show that we can use this process that we use for Jakarta EE8 and repeat it for Jakarta EE9, repeat it for Jakarta EE10, and then see what type of cadence we can come up with after that. Were you actually surprised that uh, Oracle open sourced Java? Oh, we were very surprised. Um, Oracle had reached out to... Um, us, I, I know IBM and uh, Red Hat, and wanted to meet up with us to, uh, but but they didn't tell us what it was about, and you know we we had no idea what the meeting was going to be, and um, I actually I couldn't I couldn't make it. Um, Ian ended up going um, mm -hmm. uh, to to represent IBM, and the meeting was over in. Um, London, as a matter of fact, and when they um, when they got together, then they proposed this idea of moving it to open source, and neither us or Red Hat had any idea that that's what they were going to propose. So it was a very pleasant surprise. That is cool. I, I, I thought it was like uh, it was known, you know, around uh, the the vendors, but uh, this is this is interesting. Uh, what I know is the uh, there was a new guy. He came from Joint. I forgot the name. It was the the manager from the new manager from Oracle, which initiated the whole open sourcing. Um, it, it he also delivered the keynote at the Java One back then. You remember his name? Um, I know who you're talking about because he came from IBM, and right now I can't remember his name. Okay, uh, exactly. And but, and, and he initiated because I already had a, a podcast with Mike Milinkovic, and we talked about that and. And um, I forgot his name. And and he initiated the open sourcing. So he asked, you know, Eclipse and CNCF and Apache. And Eclipse was the organization which was uh, the, the most pragmatic one. I'm just drawing a blank on the guy's name. I talked with him a few times, but can't remember it. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. I will try to find that in the show notes. And uh, Mark Kavich. Yep, there you go. Yeah, he's on... Mark Kevich on Twitter, and now he says SVP engineering of Salesforce. Okay, exactly. And uh, I, I I listened to his keynote, and I say, hey, what he delivers on the keynote, it was like you know, uh, I remember what he did. He also open source in the open source the or initiated the FN project for Oracle, and they had you know on stage they uh, created a repo with a, with a button click. So okay, this is this doesn't look like Oracle. You yep. know? This is more like. Uh, uh, a startup, so it was. It was interesting. Okay, and um, yeah. now um, recently, what happened? I think today or or yesterday, I think it was decided in the steering committee. I think you one of the steering committee, right? So, Jakarta. -y? Yes. Yeah, that uh, there will be Big Bang Java X uh, um, migration, right? Java X to Jakarta. Yeah. So, um, just to explain that aspect a little bit more. Um, because I, I, I've had quite a few discussions with the team from the Eclipse Foundation and our steering committee. And the thing that was kind of published, I think Ivar ended up posting something on um, yeah. Twitter or something like that. 
and he explained that the steering committee had proposed, you know, certain criteria for Jakarta EE9. So now that is, you know, supposed to be uh, presented. It's accepted by the platform. So the Jakarta EE platform team, the one that owns the Jakarta EE platform, we need to take that input from the steering committee and look at it, um, you know, discuss it and decide, is it doable? Is what they are requesting for the content and the date, is this doable? And, you know, if it is, great, we accept it, and we tell the steering committee, yep, okay, grand plan, we're going to move forward with it. If there is something with this proposal that we don't agree with from a platform perspective, then we need to negotiate that with the steering committee so that we can come to a common roadmap between what the platform committee or platform project determines what they can do and what the steering committee really wants. Mm -hmm. So what I compared it to, um, to someone on um, uh, Christian on Twitter, is I kind of compared it to your manager. So your manager comes to you with these, you know, requirements and I need this, you know, this capability and needs to be done by next Friday. And then you have to put in your dose of reality and you have to look at it and say, okay, but, um, if you know if you require this type of capability, then that's going to mean this type of work and this type of work, and I can't complete it by such and such date. So you know that's where the negotiating comes in. So is the date the most important thing, or is it the content? So the the thing I want to get across is that what the steering committee has requested of the platform project that does not mean that that's cut and duck dried and that's exactly what's going to be produced sure this is what the steering committee is requesting and now we have to determine whether or not that's doable so from my understanding is this like the steering committee is more like the dreamers and the platform people are more like the workers right <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay but yeah, uh, very, i have to say so. the uh proposal f for me as a known um outside or external observer it would be the best decision ever. And the reason being is because uh, it becomes clear, you know, now we are independent and this will start with Jakarta and for everyone is, uh, for every developer, it's really obvious what happens. It's okay, the new stuff, Jakarta, starts with Jakarta and the old dead stuff, Java E, it starts with Java X. And this will be the best possible yep. decision, uh, regardless whether it is doable or not, but from the external perspective. And, I ask you know, a lot oh. of conferences and Java user groups, developers, and no one said so far they would like to have you know incremental, uh, in incremental the um, migration. Oh, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I'm not going to you know try to justify one or the other. Um, I just wanted to to point out that it, you know it still is something that does need to be agreed to by the platform yeah, project, sure, sure, but. Sure. Everybody, I will agree, everybody that we have been talking with, you know, even at our IBM conferences, um, the the Big Bang approach, that seems to be the one that most people want to go with. Yes. Totally agree with that. And uh, 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 another observation from, from the outside, or, or my opinion, is and how I sell the whole thing is, for me, the Jakarta E is more or less like, you know, the operating system, major, but it, I wouldn't expect, you know, too much going into the platform because over time it gets bigger and bigger. And I would say how how much you can improve CDI. I mean, it is it is like it is. I mean, it, it is really hard to find new features or, or or you know revolutionary features. Or you you won't find anything you know revolutionary in ORM probably. And uh, so this is like more stable platform with cadence. I would say one or two years, something more reasonable, more like you know cadence over Linux distribution. And the micro profile, it would be tied to standards which are not related to Java at all. They could be you no know, Kubernetes or cloud or whatever, CNCF, and they can iterate faster. And this would be the distinction. So I think it's actually to, a good idea to keep them separate. Uh, do you have opinion? Can, can, can you talk about that? Or what's your opinion about that? Yeah, um, definitely I want to keep them separate and I'm going to qualify it at least for the time being. And the main reason is exactly what you just talked about is 
You know, I mentioned Microprofile. The first release was in 2016. And here it is three years later, and we just did a 3.1 release of the platform, which includes like 25 component releases of, you know, the config, fault tolerance, health, and, you know, metrics and all that, um, all the different versions that we've done there. Um, That cadence, there is no way that the Jakarta EE process could keep up with that right now. So... If, you know, and I, I know there's some people out there that are saying that microprofile should just merge with Jakarta EE. But if we do that, I see microprofile coming to a dead stop um, because Jakarta EE process just can't keep up with that type of capability and the, and the cadence that microprofile has done over the last uh, three years. So for now, anyway, we have to keep them separate. Yes. Now, if, if, we can get Jakarta EE on a more regular cadence and it, you know, we could even, you know, start to produce releases on a more regular basis. Okay. Then maybe some of the capability from microprofile, maybe it does belong over in Jakarta EE and, and that we can make a decision on later. But right now I think we have to keep them separate. Yes. And I think it is understandable. It's more like, you know, almost like a decorator pattern microprofile. It uses lots of, you know, Jakarta features, but it's not bound to Jakarta. So I don't see, you know, the reason why it should be put everything together. And also, right. what can happen is, let's imagine open metrics like Prometheus will die because CNCF decides, you know, there's another standard, which can actually happen. So th- then the uh, microprofile metrics becomes pointless. So, but this is really dangerous, you know, to have a stable platform like Jakarta being dependent on something which we cannot control, right? Oh, I perfect example of that um, is the open tracing effort. Yeah. So, you know, microprofile open tracing was based off of the work from OpenTracing.io, and now that is kind of ending and moving towards open telemetry, and mm-hmm. so. That, you know, that's something that microprofile that we have to figure out, okay, how are we going to move from opentracing.io to the open telemetry? And, you know, if we would, if we would have the same dilemma in Jakarta EE, um, that, that would be really tough to swallow for the customers that are expecting that, that standard to be so consistent from release to release. Yeah, and with microprofile, we have a little bit more flexibility. Because I think uh, there there are no good reasons why we should you know have breaking changes for instance new features of CDI. But I think there could be a very good reason to have breaking changes in microprofile because you know the standard which is not bound to Java changes which is outside of our control. Right, this could be one of the reasons. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And what I'm also curious about because. Um, I see, you know, on Twitter discussion, what should be deprecated in Jakarta E, and I see, you know, JSF and JSPs and whatever, but for me, these technologies are somehow useful. What I'm really, what, what, what I'm really surprised that if I mention SOAP, deprecate JAXWS, there's lots of, you know, lots of friction. They say, no, SOAP is still, u- is still in use. Sure, it is in use, but we are talking about deprecation. I don't think SOAP is the future. So um, I, right. I would even see you no know, more future in JSPs because and somehow we can use server server side rendering or you know we can do something with it, but I don't think that uh, if you start start on a greenfield, someone will get the idea to have SOAP as a primary protocol for microservices. But I absolutely we still you know in a greenfield project we use for instance JSF. Uh, just to have you know, CRUD interfaces for back office applications is perfectly you know a viable solution because it's very productive. And with JSPs, you can you know write you know uh, small I uh, know um, configuration generators, whatever. So it's very useful technology and very fast. And um, what's your opinion on SOAP? Why we cannot deprecate SOAP? We can say okay, we deprecate SOAP right now because the spec, nothing happens with the SEP. for years. It's stale. So nothing happens. There's new, no new yep. features. Nothing. So. Why we cannot deprecate soap? So my take is is that we could. Yeah. And this kind of gets back to your comment earlier that those technologies that need to continue to live for 
you know, whatever you whatever you want to call them, legacy applications or whatever, they can stay with the Java X namespace. They're yeah. part of the old Java EE, but for Jakarta EE, why do we need to pull these types of technologies forward? Exactly. So that that's my view. Now yeah. I I know you know there are others with different viewpoints, and so you know we need to. <laughs> need to negotiate that but that's my viewpoint yeah but just from logical point of view even if uh, no vendor has a uh, p- support they can provide you no know, support forever for java x namespace and for jakarta it could be even an optional support they can migrate it over do whatever they like but this would be no outside the standard you know it's not like deprecation doesn't mean for me that it will remove it's impossible so afterwards from java 8 this is not what i'm talking about it will stick forever for java 8 you know and for the new right. stuff, I don't think that SOAP is necessary. And in the microservice architecture, you can still, you know, extract parts of the old monolith without SOAP and then even create, you know, a thin layer with old Java 8 stuff with SOAP, which talks to the modern stuff behind. So I don't see even, even the point. And also, like, yep, each, I... yeah, and in, in in my opinion, we should, you know, remove as, as, as much as possible from Jakarta E and keep, you know, it small and nimble and um, and then it becomes more interesting because right now it's right. If someone starts with Jakarta E and says, you know, 500 packages, they don't even know where to start. And I have to admit in my projects, I also use a fraction from the Jakarta E specification, but the servers are so small that for me it doesn't matter, you know. I, whether I see 500 packages or three, it is fast and small enough. So there's for me is not a big difference. Yep, I, I, I think we're in agreement on this. <laughs> okay, this is what I... What I didn't thought about. I think you will be. You you had the reasons for being, uh, you know, pro soap. But for me, uh, yeah, it's interesting because, um, yeah, I, I mean, good times, right? Um, and um, what I already uh, told you, I don't know whether it, uh, we, we met at uh, briefly at EclipseCon, that uh, what happens frequently to me is I you know I s- still show on conferences Jakarta E and MicroProfile, and I see you know younger people coming to me and and ask me you no. Know, what you did on stage, what was it? It's like, hey, it's called, you know, Java E or Jakarta E, and they write down, you know, Jakarta E. What is the page? It's like, hey, you cannot exactly run Jakarta E. We need a server or runtime. So I point them to Whitefly, Open Liberty, Payara, and Tommy. They ask, you know, which which to choose. It's like, whatever you like, all are good. And they are actually delighted. So um, it seems like now, you know, the Jakarta and MicroProfile became, you know, the simplest possible <laughs> solution where you can start, you know, in 30 seconds to be productive. And uh, all the other lightweight solutions, which were, you know, the, uh, they, 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 they are probably more powerful, but it's not as easy. So this is really funny for me to observe. Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't know what else to add to that, Adam. It, it, um, I, I agree with you. Yeah, perfect. So um, any final words or topics we forgot to talk about? And um, do you have any topics interesting? Or you will ask me, you know, opinion about specific stuff why well, we've covered a lot of different topics yeah and it always starts in my podcast you know with the question how you started programming and by the way the question was uh, i had a podcast with james gosling and i think uh in one hour and 20 minutes we we stopped with jdk 11 so uh james gosling <laughs> had I know, a long history so we will do a follow-up in one point of time. So this is just what happens on my show. It's really interesting, you know, the road to something, how, how something happened. Um, so where people can find you, and can you provide me some links, you know, to Open Liberty, your Twitter and blog or whatever you like? Sure. Um, so one thing before I do that, while we were talking, since you, you know, um, you asked me about uh, the origins of Open JPA. So I looked it up and... OpenJPA actually started um, from a project called Kodo, and that was part of BEA. BEA contributed Kodo to the Apache Foundation under OpenJPA. You are absolutely right. I remember Kodo. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So I, I, you, I thought for you know when you challenged me on it, I thought cheapers. Did I get my, you know, names all mixed up? But nope, that, this is right. So that. That was in 2006 when they did that donation. Okay. So anyway, now getting back to how to contact me, um, I I stay quite active on Twitter. So that's the at sign, mm-hmm. K.W. Sutter. 
Okay. A W S U T T E R. Um, so that that's an easy way to get a hold of me. Um, my Gmail account yeah, is don't do this. K W Sutter. Okay. <laughs> What's that? I said, don't do this. You get lots of emails, probably. Oh, I don't know. I no more than doing Twitter, is it? Okay, you are right. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um, but okay. So okay, you also asked about websites then. Yeah. So um, very easy to remember these. Um, open Liberty, OpenLiberty.io, mm -hmm. and if anyone is interested in that, um, I would highly recommend taking a look at the guides. All of our guides, they're 20 minutes or less, and we've got all of the microprofile and many of the Java EE and Jakarta EE technologies um, where you can quickly um, develop and use Open, open Liberty in order to um, experiment with these different technologies. So I, I think it's a fantastic place to start. Yes, um, uh, this is what I also, can also say. The, the guides are really nice, and you have guides about everything. So. Uh, most of or, yep, all and, micro profile, you know, guides. There are Jakarta e guides. And by the way, someone asked me, you know, where to find some resources about Jakarta e and micro profile. And it turns out, you know, every vendor has a lots of guides. There are Helidon guides, Quarkus guides. We have Open Liberty guides. There are Jakarta e Payara blocks. There's like a huge amount of material around Jakarta e. I think. The only problem is probably SEO marketing stuff. So if we had you know, a common portal for all the stuff, there would be more, I think, more stuff than the the Holy Bible about about micro profile yeah. in Jakarta E, and um, yeah. But I absolutely yeah, open liberty is great. Yeah. Yep, and considering that um, that common portal, that is actually something that both micro profile and Jakarta E are working on. Um, because we know that we've got multiple implementations out there. And so if, you know, like if I was going to point people at microprofile.io, that's a simple website, and then Jakarta, jakarta.ee, simple website to go to. But one thing that we do need to work on a little bit more is, okay, that's a common portal, and now depending on your needs, you know, for whatever reason, then maybe you would like to go from that common portal to other websites that might provide additional information for you. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe you are an IBM shop, so you're interested in microprofile. Now, what versions of IBM software support microprofile? And so having that common portal and getting off to the individual implementations, I think, would be a worthwhile exercise and something that we are aware of. Um, and we're working on, we just don't have a solution in place yet for it. Or, or uh, the reverse could be even more interesting. They would say, okay, there's like, you know, a application like a pet store, let's say. You can build it with MicroProfile, Jakarta E, and then the end, you can say, if you like, deploy to, you know, Open Liberty, Tommy, Payara, and uh, Helidon, Quarkus, yep. Cumulus, or whatever. And because then it says, okay, uh, there is one common programming model. And, and several runtimes, and it's even more appealing, I would say. Yep, and and we do a little bit of that with our start.microprofile.io, too. So that's kind of a common spot where you could go to to get sample applications, and then depending on what platform you want to go to, then it would generate the, the appropriate POM files and stuff for you for, you know, whether you're going to Tommy or Pyara or Open Liberty. Exactly. So perfect. So I would say um, okay. thank, thank you for your time. And what I would like to do is follow up with you and then talk just exclusively, you know, uh, about MicroProfile Jakarta e progress or whatever fresh topics we have. Yeah, that, that would be good. So then thank you and bye. Okay, thank you. Have a good weekend.